but there's just something about the presence of God. I'd like to share with you today from Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to verse 13, um, I'm assuming most people have actually heard this passage before. It is also known as the Lord's Prayer. Um, and I just want to talk about prayer today. I want to talk about uh, connecting with God, um, discovering what happens in prayer, and also what responsibilities we have in prayer. Um, I, I love the fact that God allows us to just come to Him the way we are. Um, it, it's something beautiful. He, he doesn't have a prerequisite. He says, come. Uh, he's a rewarder of those that seek Him. But even though He doesn't have prerequisites, as we are in His presence, we discover things can't stay the way they are. In multiple senses, we can't stay the way we are, but also the circumstances, the world around us cannot stay the way it is. Um, and as we pray, as we step into His presence, um, we discover exactly that. That the way this world is, the way our families are, our cities, uh, and it's not a critique at all. Uh, but it's that we want to see things the way God does. So I'm going to read Matthew 6, 9-13. I'll be using the, King, uh, the New King James translation. So if it doesn't sound as traditional as you might have grown up, or if it's a little different than uh, unusual, please forgive me. But uh, we have it right there it's, uh, so that we can expound. In this matter, therefore, pray, Our Father in Heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus comes up to his disciples to teach them to pray. And this is the prayer he gives them. Um, having grown up in the Pentecostal church, in, in a move of the Holy Spirit, we have a tendency, I find, to step away from liturgy. We, we believe in the move of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the freedom of the power of God. And it's a blessed, it's a powerful thing. But sometimes we miss out on the power of liturgy. Liturgy has a pedagogic effect of, through repetition, learning and understanding. And in my city, in, in Magdeburg, um, when I arrived 10 years ago, I was your typical crazy Pentecostal. Uh, kind of thought we were the best kind of church in town, and we don't need the others. Um, and, but being in the former east of Germany, you also realize uh, there aren't many other churches. Our city has 230,000 people and eight free evangelical churches. Mathematically, you can kind of, uh, And it's not like each church is booming at 1,000 people per Sunday morning. It's more like each church is running between 20 and 40 people Sunday morning. Right? There's one church with 120, but that's pretty much, you know, the, the realm we're in. So you kind of lay off your ideals, um, because they're man-made ideals, and you come together as a body. And you come together, the Pentecostals and Baptists, and all of a sudden the Adventists join in, and then the, the Lutheran church, <laughs> church joins in, sometimes the Catholic church joins in. And you're sitting there, and I as a Pentecostal pastor, I'm sitting there, and kind of like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be with all these people, um, I don't know if I can pray, you know, I had certain prejudices. Um, but you get together and then all of a sudden you pray together. And on one hand there's the power of prayer itself because each person in faith is calling out to God with a pure heart. And all of a sudden you realize, oh wow, they do believe. And then you listen to what they're praying and then you realize, wow, they really believe. At least the people that were sitting with me. And one of the things I've come to appreciate about some of these churches and some of these groups is a certain level of liturgy. Now, I'm not calling us to, to give up on all our freedoms and stop the flow. Not at all. But I've come 
to appreciate certain aspects. And one of them is the Lord's Prayer. Now, I love the Lord's Prayer, but I love it as something that I look at and structure my prayer life to. And I see this element and that element. Or I'm going to jump into that because I love it. But there's this power of actually using it daily. Of something as simple as just repeating this prayer that Jesus gives his disciples as the way to pray. To actually repeat it regularly. To allow the simple truths to come to life every day. Whether it's in the morning, in the noontime, or in the evening. Or maybe even three times a day, however you like but there's something powerful about repeating these truths and letting them go from our mind to our hearts. Because it's through this repetition that it actually becomes more and more a part of who we are. And not a blind repetition as in I, I already know the prayer and somebody would start it and we just blab it out because we already know it off by heart. And I, I can remember myself as a kid and then seeing if I could finish the prayer quicker than the rest of the church. Yeah, and then you, you meet with other kids and you see who can finish the Lord's Prayer the quickest. I was never going to. <laughs> but I'm talking about allowing the prayer to come and touch our hearts. The Lord's Prayer starts with our Father. Our means it's not just my father, meaning my faith is not just an issue of myself. It means that faith is an issue of the people. That means I can't live my faith alone. The faith, our faith in Jesus Christ is actually not just about me. It's not just about my personal salvation and my personal encounter with God. But when Jesus calls his people to prayer, he says, Our Father, allowing us to realize we are in a we situation. Not my Father, which he could have said, and nobody would have been like, Oh, his Father, he's only his Father, not my Father. I, God's my Father. Not at all. He says, Our Father. That means we all have the right to step in, but we all have the responsibility to realize that our faith is not lived alone. That means my faith is expressed in the body. The fulfillment of my faith is expressed in the body. And my responsibility one to another, my responsibility of discovering that at the steps of faith I take have an impact on other people, but also I have a responsibility to help others grow in their faith. To see people in their hurt and weakness and to help them stand up, to help them walk, to help them move forward, and to come to the place of unity. Not only just realizing it's about me and others, because in church we, we, we not, not, not this church, but in other churches, I've heard of, of, of churches having cliques, different groups of people that, that communicate together, and they understand them, each other better than the others, and that's why it's easier, right? Uh, about a third to half of our church are Hispanics in the Maktabu. And so it's easier for the Hispanics to meet together after service, to sit together, to speak together, to drink coffee and to eat cake, and just to speak in Spanish, just, just a simple a language aspect that makes it easier. And at the same time, if we're a body, it's got to be more than just a group of people coming together in one language, in one tongue. It's us coming together and being the body and realizing that our faith is more than just where we're from in the language we speak and the expression how we have it. But our faith is coming together, uniting. In Psalm 133, it says that when people, brothers, gather together in unity, the blessing of the Lord is commanded. Commanded. So there's something about unity that when we come together in unity, that releases an incredible blessing. In the book of Genesis, when it's talking about the, the Tower of Babel, God is speaking and he expresses if they come together, nothing is impossible. And this isn't even the work of God. This isn't even in the empowering of the Holy Spirit. It's just people coming 
together. People believing to, in something that is bigger than themselves. People willing to sacrifice their ego for something greater. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's what the whole gospel is about. If Jesus calls us to deny ourselves and take up our cross, that's the greatest call to let go of your ego. There it is. And if we do that, the step into unity is much easier. So Jesus starts our prayer with our Father. Our. Realizing for prayer to work, for faith to work, for faith to truly be released, there's the understanding of sacrificing myself, of letting go of my ego, taking up my cross, denying myself and following it. So prayer starts with the realization, as I step into the presence of God, I'm going to have to let go of myself. Prayer starts, and I'm going to say this again so that we understand this. Prayer starts as I step into the presence of God and the realization that I'm about to pray, I'm letting go of myself. That's scary because I have a lot of issues I want him to do or take care of in my life. And too many times my prayer life is about what I want him and I think I need him to do in my life. And after I've gotten rid of that load off my shoulders, my prayer stops and I move on. That's not prayer. That's having a pity party and crying to God and hoping he's going to take care of something. And the amazing part is he is so good. He is so loving. He is so kind. He is our provider. He is our healer. He is the person that's going to take care of us. He'll take better care of us than anybody else. So he'll hear these prayers and he'll answer. And if you have faith, he'll answer in a powerful way. But that still doesn't mean you've understood prayer. Still doesn't mean we're moving and flowing in the power of of prayer. So first of all, we understand it's about the community of faith. And then this community of faith doesn't come together as slaves, it doesn't come together as friends, but it comes together as sons and daughters of the living God. It says, our Father. When we approach God, we in prayer, we approach Him as His children. Um, if I can get a little old school, I'll even say as we approach God, we approach Him as sons. Ladies, please understand, don't be offended, okay? But we men have to deal with the fact that we're the bride of Christ, and there, there's no way around that, okay? We're men, we're the bride of Christ, we need to deal with it, and that's the way it is. In Scripture, and I, I, I'll, I'll explain it a little bit, in Scripture it says we come to Him as sons. Now the reason why it's sons and not gender neutral or sons and daughters is because at the time, the inheritance only went to the sons. So if it, you're talking about in the, the image at the time, the cultural image of the time, if you're talking about sons and daughters, you're not, you can't have an inheritance because the daughters didn't have an inheritance at the time. The inheritance, the main inheritance, went to the firstborn son. And everybody else kind of had to fend for themselves. And so this image is there that the sons, that when we pray, we are sons. And it's because when we pray, we have an understanding that He is our Father and we have an inheritance. So that is the image, okay? So, but that, of course, still means everybody comes to Him as His child. So don't, don't worry. I'm not, I'm not trying to exclude anybody or leave anybody out of ministry, okay? Third generation minister. My mom is a pastor. My grandmother is a pastor. So I'm um, have a different understanding. Don't worry about that. But when we come, we come to our Father. And it's key, because sometimes when we come and pray, um, we come as beggars. We come pleading, crying, weeping. And again, I understand, we have moments where we're moved. And, but there's something about understanding your position and faith in coming to God. Because... Um, when, when scripture talks about us being slaves to Christ, that context is always according to the call of God in our lives. Never in the context of prayer. Being a slave in Christ means that I, I, I've discovered the call of God in my life. And there's this burning passion desire. I cannot help but obey this call. 
I am a slave to the call of God. Yes, I am still free, but at the same time, in my heart, in my spirit, I, there's a burning desire to fulfill this call. I can't do anything else but fulfill the call of God in my life. And then, so the context of being a slave is always in the context of the call of God and not in prayer. Okay, Even the, the context of being a friend of God is just in my walk. It's in, in my daily walk, I, I just walk and I am a friend of God. You are a friend of God. We are in fellowship, we are in communion. But the understanding of prayer, the understanding of prayer, intercession, of, of stopping everything else and getting to that secret place, that is always connected to being a son. And an heir. Somebody with inheritance. A child of God. So, when we look, for example, at a king's strategy, um, when a king is going to share information, secret information, a king doesn't share his information to all the soldiers. He doesn't share his plans, to, even to some of the top generals. The king shares his information with his family. He shares the secrets of his heart with his sons, with his daughters. Now that's the key. When we come into prayer, he's going to show you his secrets. He's going to show you his heart and what is moving and stirring in his heart. So you get to know it. So you are connected to him, not just by redemption, not just by, by faith, but out of a connect, being connected to him because your heart has heard the secrets of God. Because he's whispered into your ear the things that are precious to him. He starts to whisper in your ear the plans he has for your life and for those around you and for your city and for your church. And that is out of intimacy. That is out of sonship. And not because we're servants. Not because we want to do the best. Not because, you know, we're crying out and use people. But simply because we're his children. And I say that to... To bring us to a place of rest and relaxation. Because I want us to, to, to come to a place where there's this aspect of the kingdom of God that we're not striving. We're not pushing. We're not forcing. We're not manipulating our prayers to make God move. We're not trying to say the right thing so that he, he, we think he hears us in the right way. And then now that we said it right, now that we did this, we've kind of twisted God's arm and now he's going to do it. No. You are his child. He delights in you. He enjoys hearing your voice. He enjoys spending time with you. And he's waiting and he's ready for you to come, open your heart, and share it. And as you do it, he's going to reciprocate. He will open his heart to share. So that, that to me, that just took this distance between man and God, and it just flattened it. All of a sudden, our standing before God is in, but it's face to face. As we sit down, have a cup of coffee, have a cup of tea. If you want cake, have cake. If you don't, don't. Just sit and talk with God. That, that, that's, I want us to understand that powerful image. That's the reason why Moses confronts God and says, God, no, 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 no. You can't kill the people of Israel and start over again. Because though he has the fear of God and he's in awe of God, he also understands his, his connection to and he says, God, you can. You can't go back on your word. You said you're going to take care of your people and you can do it. This is God and Moses at the coffee table. I can say that. Okay? When you look at God and Abraham, they're sitting, they're sitting down at the coffee table. When you look at the prayers of Jesus, they're sitting down at the coffee table and they're sharing their hearts. They're sharing their hearts because they're his children. Sons and daughters, their heirs. The 
There's something supernatural about discovering God as Father. I, I had uh, an incredibly amazing Father. I, I still have an incredibly amazing Father. Um, I think many issues of my faith life have been so easy because I, the understanding of how good God is connected for me very easily to my father. Um, the understanding that anything I ask, I'm going to be taken seriously, regardless of how stupid it is. I'm going to be taken seriously when, when I ask for childish, useless things in my life, and I ask God to give me this and give me that. The reason why I believe God takes me seriously is because I have a father that takes me seriously. Now the reality is not everybody has a father. Not everybody has experienced the love of a father, the care of a father, the, the, the unconditional love that a father has for his children. Here's the amazing part. Even if you haven't, as you step into prayer and as you open your heart, he reveals himself as the father that no human being could reveal himself to you as. And regardless of how good my father is, he has his shortcomings. And there's an aspect that as I encounter God, he supersedes anything my, my personal father could do. And so even if we haven't had a perfect example of what a father is, as we call out to God, he shows himself in our hearts and he dis we discover what a true father is, especially for the man in here. If you're sitting in here and you might have issues with your father and, and you might be worried about your future and how you're going to deal with your family and how you're going to deal with your kids, the issue, the power of prayer is that as you come, your heart will be touched and transformed. And even the shortcomings of your father will not come upon you. But you are set free because you are new in Christ. And as you discover the heart of the father, that is the heart that you will give your family. That is the heart that you will transcend and keep hand over and part to your children and to your family. And that, that's powerful. That's powerful. Even if we've been cast aside, if we, even if we've been let go, if people in our family that have left us and didn't want to have anything to do with us and rejected us, even if we've heard words of, of hate and anger from our Father, as we come to God the Father, He touches our hearts. And that's release, that's let go. And we discover who a real Father is. That is God the Father. And He is always a good father. So we, we step into prayer and we realize it's not about us. And we come into prayer and we realize it is about us being connected to the father as a family. Then he goes on and says, Hallowed be your name. If I can, I'll, I'll skip the, the hallowed part first and then I'll go to name. So name actually doesn't just mean name. It doesn't just mean the name of God. But name, the word name actually means the reputation. The word name actually means that the person I have presented myself as is the person that I'm going to be. It means that I am true to myself. So when God says, how will be his name? When he talks about bringing his name into the picture, God is talking about keeping his reputation. God is talking about being faithful to his promises. That means that everything he has told us he's going to do, he has to do it because he is true to his name. When he says in the Psalms, I have exalted my word above my name, he's declaring that he did, the power of his word is as powerful as his reputation. If he said he's going to do it, he will do it. Mary, the Virgin Mary, is impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And her words are, if you said it, it's going to happen. By your word, nothing is impossible. And that, that is the power of his name. That is the power of the name for us, of the name of Jesus. That as we connect to the name of Jesus, we call out the name of Jesus. We are calling out on the reputation of God. That what he said he is going to do, he will do in your life. He is faithful to call. He is faithful to answer. 
And so when we look at his reputation, his reputation is unlike any other. In fact, here it says it is hallowed, it is holy, it is set apart. This reputation is, uh, reputation is unlike any other reputation in the world. When he says, hallowed be his name, he's declaring that his reputation, his name, is set apart. You can talk about the best person and the person that, that says that their word is bond and they say they're going to do something and they do it and, and you, you just stand in awe of how they accomplish everything they say they're going to do. And then when it says, hallowed be his name, it's, it's one step above. It's holy, separated, uncompar incomparable with anything else because it's so pure, it's so righteous, it's so holy. So his name, his reputation is incomparable. And he's putting his name on the line for your life. That means is when he says he's going to be active in your life, he's going to be active. When he says he's going to show up and touch your heart, he's going to show up and touch your heart. When he says he invites us to be called to prayer, that anything we ask in the name of Jesus according to his will, we shall receive. That means we shall receive. That means that any time that two or three agree upon one thing and he will hear from heaven, he will answer that prayer because his name is holy. His name, his reputation is set apart. It's different than asking anybody else. That's powerful. Our Father in heaven, hallowed your name. Now we get into the action. Your kingdom come. The kingdom of God is the realm of his authority. The kingdom of God is the realm of his power, his glory, and his authority. That means the kingdom of God is anywhere where the power of God is absolute. Now according to the Bible, it says in Luke 17, 20, 21, that the kingdom of God is neither here nor there, but the kingdom of God is within us. So that means that the power of God, that means that the glory of God and the authority of God is everywhere where you go. Everywhere you go is the kingdom of God. This building isn't the kingdom of God, but these people are the kingdom of God. That means as you walk out this door, and as you step into the Uba, as you step into the bus, as you step into your car, as you're walking down the street, wherever you're going, you are bringing the kingdom of God with you. That means you are bringing the power of God, the power of God to heal every sickness is walking with you. The power of God to set people free from bondage, from fear, from any problem, it's walking with you. The kingdom of God actually means, oh wait, I can't get through it. I gotta wait to heaven, to earth, and heaven. The kingdom of God is realizing that everything he has stored up in heaven is living within you. That oh, this is scary for us. And there is no lack. In, in Ephesians 1.3 it says we have received every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. That means my heart is full. That means I have no lack of peace. I have no lack of joy. I have no lack of, of life teeming, dwelling within me. In John 10, 10, it says he has come to give us life and life more abundantly. And that life is what we call the kingdom of God. And how does the kingdom of God, is how is it released in our life? Through the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is the presence of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is inviting the Holy Spirit. Probably the easiest way for us to realize the realization of the kingdom of God is to just say, Holy Spirit, come. He already dwells within us, but as we ask Him to come, we are more aware of who He is, and we are more aware, aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. And we open ourselves for more. And that is the kingdom of God. I, I, I want to encourage you to invite the Holy Spirit to move more in your life. I want to invite, encourage you 
the Holy Spirit to come. Fill your heart. I want to encourage you to, to seek the presence of the Holy Spirit. To seek, if you have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to seek the fullness, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As Paul, John the Baptist calls it, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. That's the release of the power of God. And whenever that power is released, and we look in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, and Acts chapter 4, and Acts chapter 8 and 9, and Acts chapter 15 and 19, every time the power of the Holy Spirit comes, something happens. There's an explosion. Some people start to prophesy. Some people start to speak in new tongues. But whenever the Holy Spirit shows up, something comes to life that wasn't living before. And that is the kingdom of God, that the dead comes to life. That the tired awaken, that the light of Christ is present. That is the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is the kingdom of God. That is us walking through the streets. Wherever you walk, the dead is coming to life. Those that are spiritually sleeping will arise and wake up. Wherever there is darkness, light comes. Because you ask the Holy Spirit to fill it. Because you have realized it's our Father that there are people around you don't know him yet. And that they need this life. They need this fullness. That they can cry out, our Father. That they can experience everything he has for them. The kingdom of God. Here. On earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's where we discover in our hearts what is going on in heaven. And we bring it down here. What is the will of God in heaven? What is God's desire for our cities, for our families, for our churches? And we bring it, we release it here. And that's the challenge. We can only discover the will of God. We can only discover His will on earth as it is in heaven as we pray, as we pray. Step into his word. His word comes alive in us. The essence of prayer is exactly this. Bringing the kingdom of God from heaven here to earth. Making this earth more like heaven. Now I know there are different streams in theological thought that, that this world will become darker and, and before Jesus comes everybody's going to be in suffering and pain. I personally don't step into that realm of theology because my understanding is that wherever I go there's light. Wherever I go there is life. Wherever I go somebody's waking up. Now if that's who, what happens when I show up and when Jesus comes with me in the presence of the Holy Spirit how on earth is this place supposed to be getting darker? Then obviously the church is failing and I don't see when I look around the world Europe is having a hard time. I know it's spiritually the dark continent. But when we look at everywhere else in the world, when we look at Asia, Africa, South America, we see the presence of the Holy Spirit booming. The presence of God is moving. And forgive me for saying this, it might sound a little racist, but this train of thought comes from a bunch of white people that don't see and experience the presence of God. Because wherever you go, with the presence of God is moving, churches are being planted, people are coming to Christ in the hundreds and even thousands, people are being baptized in water, people are being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I believe, I believe God has it for Europe. Every time you lift up your hands, every time you lift up your voice and you call the name of 
Jesus. Believe your sin. Switching and shifting the atmosphere of Hanover. Believe that as you call out the name of Jesus, something is stirring in this city. Something is being risen. Something is being awakened. Something is being brought back to life. Darkness is fleeing and light is coming into this city. Just as you lift up your hands. Just as you call the name of Jesus. Just as you start to worship and pray in other tongues. Power is being released in this city. And that is bringing heaven here on earth. And that is the essence of prayer. And that is why God has brought us here. He has brought us here this morning to equip us, to empower us, to release us, that we don't hold what we have. As he says in 1 Corinthians, that we are earthen vessels, but there is glory inside us. He has filled us to spill us. He has given us so that we can give back, press down, shaking together, and every measure overflowing. That is the kingdom of God. That is bringing His will here on earth. It's us experiencing the presence of God. It's us experiencing the truth and the power of this word coming alive in our hearts. That we start reading the Bible and, and as we read all of a sudden something starts bubbling up within me and, and in my situation, my circumstances, all of a sudden I have a different perspective to them because it's not my perspective out of my flesh. It's not my perspective out of my position and my point of view. But I allow the word of God to come in to renew my mind, to transform the way I think, and I start seeing my situation differently. I start seeing my circumstances differently because of this everlasting powerful word that is sharper than a double-edged sword, that is good to discern between good and evil comes alive within me. It separates what I don't need from my life. And it opens my heart for the truth of God. That changes and transforms me. And with this change and transformation, I come and I talk to God. With coffee or with tea, your trust. And I experience that what He has said is true for my life. And I am so blessed and so touched and changed that I can't hold it for myself. And I share it with those that are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And as I share the living water, <coughs> as I share the bread of life, they taste and they see that He is good. And the prayer goes on and says, give us this day our daily bread. Again, I come to God and I, I realize my need for Him. I realize my need for His bread. And who is the bread of life? Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the Word of God. So my bread of life is this Word. As the people of Israel went through the desert, God provided for them supernaturally. He provided manna from heaven. The interesting thing about manna, about this bread-like substance, is it was only good for the day, the following day. Because people, you know, people like to gather and store and like to make sure that they have more than somebody else the next day. People would gather the manna from that day, hide it, and then the next day want to eat it while the fresh stuff was coming, just so that they could have more. Or they didn't believe God was going to provide the next day. But the next day, what happened? The manna was bad. So, and I don't want to say the word of God goes bad. But what I do want to encourage, we have a responsibility for a fresh word. We are responsible for fresh bread in our life. We are responsible to make sure that the word of God comes to life within us. And I, I know we're, we're not in a bread-eating culture as much here. <laughs> Having married a, a German woman, and, uh, we do eat bread. And there's something special about picking up a fresh bread from the bakery while it's still warm, cutting it, putting some butter on it, watching it just melt, and popping it in your mouth. Some people put a little bit of salt and pepper on it. 
and and biting into it. There's something fresh about it. Something that you just think, wow. Like when I know the, the disadvantage of buying fresh bread and putting it on the table, it's usually gone in one meal. Now, if I buy the bread in the morning and we eat it at dinner, we only eat half the bread. But if it's fresh, we eat the whole bread because there's just so much taste. There's something about fresh bread that just makes you hungry. And there's something about a fresh word from God in your spirit that makes you desire more of Him. That makes you hunger for more of this word that becomes alive in you. Give us this day our daily bread is calling out to God for spiritual provision is calling out to God that He is also my natural provider. God is my provider of my finances. He's the provider of the food in my fridge or the roof over my head of the four wheels I use to get me from A to B. God is my provider and He's a good provider. Yes. He takes care of His children. Make sure there is no lack, but the provision starts in the heart. The provision doesn't start with the material. The provision starts with my heart believing He is there for me. Believing He loves me, that He longs to take care of me. Because otherwise, I come to the place where I'm begging. Where I'm asking him to do something just so that he takes care of me. But if I, I understand he is good, and I understand he is a rewarder of those that seek him, that, that's freedom. That's understanding he will provide my every need. And then he goes on and says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It starts with us receiving forgiveness. We receive forgiveness by the realization of the power of the cross, of the life Jesus Christ lived, the power of the cross, his death and his resurrection. And through his death and resurrection and him coming to life, we get to come to life. And forgiveness is the realization that there are issues in my life that I need to let go of, that I need to forgive myself, that I need to forgive others, and I need his forgiveness because I have offended God. But scripture says that I come to him and repent of my sin. He is just and faithful and true to forgive me of my sins and my unrighteousness. And he will draw me then into his presence and make me his. That's powerful. That is powerful because forgiveness is actually setting somebody free. When God forgives me, he sets himself free to love me. When I forgive somebody else, I'm setting myself free. Our issue with unforgiveness is that we think that we get to hold somebody else in bondage. We get to push down on somebody. So in our heart, we don't let them go. In our heart, we hold a grudge against them. We try and put them in chains, but the interesting thing about unforgiveness is they're not in the chains we are. By us trying to hold somebody, we're trying to manipulate, which is witchcraft. By us trying to hold somebody, we're trying to control somebody else's life because of the way they dealt with us. But there's only one person who is allowed to have control. By forgiveness, I let go of that person. I place them in the hand of God. And I say, God, that person has hurt me, has offended me, but I will not hold on to them anymore. I call out to you to touch my heart, to cleanse my heart, that I don't hold on to them anymore. That I don't hold on to the grudge anymore. I still walk in, in wisdom. I don't walk into the knife. I don't walk into purposeful hurt. But I let go. And he calls us in prayer that he would forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We would let go of those that have hurt us and offended us because he has let go of us. 
not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And here again we see our need for him. Prayer is humiliating. Prayer is coming to God and saying, I believe you have gifted me, given me capacities and strength, but I lay them down and I call on you to move on my behalf. And I'm not going to expect a move in my life according to my own strength, but according to your strength. And though you have made me capable, I will not trust in my strength, but I will trust in your strength. So when he calls out to deliverance, but deliver us from the evil one, there are three aspects here that we have seen in this prayer about our, our need for God. Our need is he needs to provide us, he needs to provide for us, he needs to forgive us, and he needs to deliver. That is powerful in prayer because prayer is realizing I have a responsibility to bring the kingdom of God here on earth. But everything that I'm doing, I require His empowerment. I require His provision in my life. I require His forgiveness in my life. And I require His deliverance in my life. And the prayer ends then, you know, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It ends with a final expression of worship. It ends that we are responsible to receive his kingdom and then to cry out to him and worship him for the beauty, for the power, and the glory of his kingdom. I want to encourage you this week to try it out. Every time you wake up, you wake up twice a day, or if you wake up once a day, how many people are getting to have a nap throughout the week? The naps, like I said, are a beautiful thing. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday naps, I think, are the most beautiful. One of the naps, of the naps throughout the week, there's something about the Sunday afternoon nap. That it's, like, it's like adding a blob of ice cream in your coffee. <laughs> when you wake up I want to encourage you to take this prayer and don't just recite it blindly take it and just speak it to himself take it and ask him to make it come alive in you. recite it that it stirs you up Recite it so that what it says stirs your heart and you realize, I want more of you. Recite it and allow it to convict you of your shortcomings. Allow it to speak to your heart and show, wait a second, there are areas where the kingdom of God isn't being manifested in my life. And then you say, come on. more of your strength, more of your power in my life. I just want to encourage you to not be afraid of our faith. I say that because our faith requires our weakness. Christianity isn't as attractive as other faiths. Christianity asks us to die to ourselves. Christianity asks us to call ourselves weak. Christianity asks us to call ourselves poor. And in this humbling, we inherit what God has for us. Every other faith requires your strength to bring revelation, nirvana, or enlightenment. It's all out of your own strength. Christianity is the only faith 
that says if you want the divine, you have to confess your weakness because you can't get it on your own. How can a human being expect to reach the divine in these weak bodies? Unless the divine one, Jesus Christ, makes the way. You're here and you don't know him and you doubt his reality, you doubt his love for you. I want you to know him. God is real. He loves you. And his revelation in your life is not dependent on your strength or dependent on your capacity to do something. But it's dependent on him loving you and wanting to show himself to you. All you have to do is ask him to come and touch your heart. And then ask him for forgiveness. To let go of your hurt and your sin. And invite the Holy Spirit in. I am grateful that I could be here. I'll be here again in January 15th. I'm looking forward to it. And I just wish you God's blessings. As you seek him, as you pray, as you call out to him, that you experience that he is real. If there's anything you take back with you today, when you call out to God, you will experience.